You are listening to a sermon delivered to White Plains Baptist Church in Pomfret, Maryland. We hope that God speaks to you through this message. If you would like to know more about the church, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you today. And I want to thank Doug for filling in for me last week. And Eastman was prepared if I couldn't come this week, so I'm thankful for him as well. And the fact that we have men in our church who are able to open up God's Word and share His truth with you. So if you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me to Psalm 40. The sermon's going to come from different portions of this psalm, but we're going to open up this morning with verses 11 through 17. So Psalm 40, starting in verse 11. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me, My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They're more than the hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified, but I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your great mercy and your steadfast love. I thank you, Father, for the fact that we can call out to you no matter what we're facing in life, knowing that we have a God who not only hears, but is able to move and to act. Father, I thank you for the wonder of who you are, that it doesn't matter where whatever is happening to us in life has come from, whether it's come from the hand of the enemy, from the hand of our own foolishness, whether it's the result of our sin, whether it's in line with your will, Lord, that you're able to take everything, Father God, regardless of its origin, and use it for your purposes. And we thank you for that, God. We exalt you in that. We thank you for your word, Lord, for the truth that it reveals to us, and We ask for that revelation now. I pray that you'd set a guard over my lips, that I would speak those things that are right and true, and that you'd be exalted among us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever faced those times in your life when the world seems to be crashing down around you? When it seems that everything that can go wrong is going wrong and you cry out to God for help and the only answer is silence. The problems continue, the struggles grow worse, and you don't know what to do, you don't know where to turn. All that you know is that there's a deep frustration and ache in your soul for which there seems to be no remedy. How do you respond during those times? To whom Or to what do you look for help? And if you've tried everything you know to try and deliverance still doesn't come, then what? Well, that's the dilemma with which the writer of this psalm is concerned. We don't know the exact situation that prompted this psalm by the poet King David, but we do know that what he writes about in this psalm speaks to the struggles that all of us face at one time or another. And David's extreme language in parts of this psalm leave no doubt 
as to the severity of his trouble. Verse 12 reads, For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They're more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. So the picture here is not of a person who's struggling a little bit, but of a man who is truly overwhelmed. He can't even count all the things that seem to be going wrong or all the things that he's done wrong in his life. If he had it to do over again, he'd do so many things differently. And yet, of course, he doesn't have it to do over again. And so he carries around this burden, a burden so great that he tells us in verse 12 he isn't even able to look up. It's the picture of a man with a heavy load on him, so heavy that his back is stooped over nearly parallel with the ground, bent so far toward the ground that even when he raises his head to see where he's going, all he sees is just the ground in front of him. That's how David feels so discouraged and so helpless that he describes his situation in verse 2 of Psalm 40 as a horrible pit and miry clay. And I love David's metaphors. They're very visual and don't leave any room for doubt as to what he's feeling. And because of that, I think we're able to empathize more with David because we've been where he is. We've felt what he's felt. So the passage speaks to us. The truth applies to our lives. So what are the truths of this psalm? How does God tell us to respond when life comes crashing down around us? What should we do when the burdens we're carrying seem so heavy that we're not even sure we can take another step? We'll look in verse 4. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. David's pointing out three possible reactions we can have to the troubles of this life. One reaction that brings blessing, and the other two that only bring death. The right response should be to trust the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust, David tells us in the first part of verse 4. But while that's the right response, the one that brings blessing, that's not the typical response. And so David goes on to contrast trusting the Lord with two other responses, respecting the proud and turning aside to lies. When David talks about not respecting the proud in verse 4, he's talking about not imitating the way in which the proud approach life. And he's not talking about the proud here in any positive sense of the word. He's talking about the proud in the sense of the arrogant. Those who are unteachable and who believe they're always right. Those who refuse to admit wrong or change the way they're living regardless of the consequences. In other passages, God speaks of the proud as those who stiffen their necks. They've determined to live life their way no matter what. And then rather than learning from the negative consequences that come, they get angry and blame other people or even blame God for the problems and sufferings of their life. Proverbs 19, verse 3 reads, The foolishness of a man twists his way, but his heart frets against the Lord. Isn't that amazing? The foolishness of a man twists his way, but his heart frets against the Lord. We build our hopes for happiness around the things the world values. Then we pursue those things. And then we get mad if God doesn't give us what we want. We make choice, choices in life based on what we think is best, even though those choices don't agree with God's perspective on what's best. And then when the negative consequences and the suffering start to come, guess who gets blamed for the suffering? God. Those who respond to the troubles of life by stiffening their necks against God and refusing to change gradually become angry and cynical and bitter. Why does God allow all these bad things to happen to me? 
He must not be good after all. And so they turn against God. Some even decide on the ultimate insult of simply choosing to not believe in Him anymore. Of course, that's not the proper response to the brokenness and struggles of life. And so David tells us, blessed is that man who does not respect the proud, who does not admire the arrogance and self-willed approach with which the proud approach life. And David goes on to say, blessed is that man who doesn't respect such as turn aside to lies. Another improper reaction to the struggles of life. This is the response of those who may start off trying to live life God's way because we're told that they turn aside to lies. And they turn aside because they lose patience with God. When patience is really an expression of our trust in God. I want you to notice, in fact, that David begins this psalm in verse 1 by telling us, I waited patiently for the Lord. And that's because David trusted God. And David knew that patience is a prerequisite for all of us living in a broken world if we ever hope to see good. It doesn't just happen. But those who turn aside to lies at some point decide they've tried it God's way long enough and things haven't worked out for them. So they decide they're going to take matters into their own hands. Sometimes this taking of matters into their own hands means a redefining of their theology and explaining a way of biblical truth. They start to look for loopholes around clear biblical teachings, some rationale they can use in order to do what they really want to do, even though the Bible clearly teaches them they shouldn't do it. Has God really said that first rationalization whispered to Eve by the serpent is the lie that they began to entertain. Has God really said that a Christian should only marry a Christian? That I shouldn't be dating non-Christians? I mean, if two people really love each other, what does it matter if one of them is not a Christian? Isn't love the most important thing? Has God really said that the only permissible grounds for divorce is adultery? And that any other reason doesn't really end the marriage in God's eyes? no matter what the government says? What if you're just not happy in the marriage? What if the person you're married to isn't meeting your needs? Isn't it God's will for you to be happy? Has God really said that you need to gather together with other believers for worship on the Lord's Day? I mean, I work hard all week and Sunday's my day off. And I think I can praise God just as much on the lake fishing as I can in church with other people. Has God really said that Jesus is the only way to God? What about people in other religions who sincerely believe what they believe? What about all those people who never heard about Jesus? And on and on and on the rationalizations go so we can believe what we want to believe and do what we want to do. Attempting to redefine or explain away clear teachings of the Bible or find loopholes around what God has said so you can do what you want to do is one of the ways people turn aside to lies whenever they're facing difficult situations or situations in which they believe God's way isn't going to work out for them. But there's also a second way that people can begin to turn aside to lies whenever the problems come. And that's by beginning to believe that God doesn't really love them that he really doesn't have their best interests at heart, that they can't trust him. Again, it's the echo of the enemy's words in Eden. You want to know the real reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree? The serpent entices Eve. It's because God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. The implication being that God doesn't want Adam and Eve to be like him. Even though he created them in his image and likeness. He's holding out on you. If anybody's going to worry about you, it's going to have to be you, the serpent says to Eve. 
Take charge of your own life. Do what you want to do. Don't trust in this so-called God who doesn't even care about you. You're the one who should be able to decide what's best for you. Make your own decisions. Make your own choices. Don't listen to that God. Because if you're ever going to be happy, you're going to have to find happiness your way. His way won't work. And so we walk down the same path as the enemy. A path that will only bring emptiness, frustration, and eventually destruction. Do you really think that Satan said what he said to Eve because he wanted her to find life? He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said, in speaking of Satan. And that's because when the serpent spoke those words to Eve, he didn't want her to find life. He wanted to separate her from the one who was life. Just like he wants to separate us from the source of life. In reality, there's only one reaction that will really work when it comes to facing the troubles of life, but it's also the hardest reaction, the one contrary to our fallen nature, and yet the only one through which peace, strength, and deliverance will ever come. Look in Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O oh Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Trusting in God is the path through the difficulties and hurts of life. Not respecting the proud, not turning aside to lies, but continuing to trust in God. So what is it that enables us to continue to trust the Lord when the hard times come? What well, gives us the strength to wait even though deliverance seems to take so long? The answer is in verse 5. Many, O oh Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. If you're going to be able to trust in God, to hang in there when the hard times come, it's going to be because you believe that God is able to do wonderful works and that God loves you, that He's on your side. And that's what David's talking about in this verse. It's the truth of which he has continually reminded himself as he's faced the difficulties of life. Verse 5, Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. David remembers who God is. Several years ago, when I was visiting in Los Angeles, I went up to the Griffith Park Observatory that overlooks the L.A. Basin. And at the observatory, they had a number of exhibits dealing with astronomy. As I walked around, I was reminded again and again of how special we inhabitants of planet Earth are in this universe. One of the exhibits was a model of our solar system with the planets going around in their orbits and rotating on their axes. And it was eye-opening to look at the Earth in the midst of that solar system. Some planets were spinning around so fast on their axis and others barely rotating at all and then there was the earth, a very even-paced, steady rotation. Some of the planets were orbiting the sun quickly. If they had seasons on those planets, the seasons would have maybe been weeks. Other planets crawled around the sun. Winters would have lasted years on those planets. And then there was the earth. 
a steady 365 and a quarter day cycle around the sun, four even seasons, the planet shifting on its axis so that the heat is better distributed on the planet over the course of the year. Then I walked around to where they had a display dealing with asteroids. One panel of the display mentioned that each year 1,500 asteroids weighing 200 pounds or more enter our atmosphere and strike the Earth. And yet in recorded history, there's only one reported case of anyone ever being killed by one of those asteroids. Another time I was visiting with some seminary friends in Texas while spending some time with them, and they took me to SeaWorld. And the aquarium there was filled with all of these weird-looking and colorful creatures. I mean, honestly, some of the creatures, you, you think they were invented by science fiction writers. And the colors were just extraordinary, like something no artist could ever create. And God created them, each one of them. In Dallas Willard's book, The Divine Conspiracy, there's a section where he talks about the character of God and how God's love and generosity flow naturally out of that character. When God offers us the abundant life, he writes, he's simply asking us to share in that which he himself has always experienced. And then Willard goes on to write about visiting a beach in South Africa near Port Elizabeth. I'd seen beaches or so I thought, but when we came over the rise where the sea and land opened up to us, I stood in stunned silence and then slowly walked toward the waves. Words can't capture the view that confronted me. I saw space and light and texture and color and power that seemed hardly of this earth. And gradually there crept into my mind the realization that God sees this all the time. He sees it, experiences it, knows it from every possible point of view. This and billions of other scenes just like this. It's perhaps strange to say, he goes on, but suddenly I was extremely happy for God and thought I had some sense of what an infinitely joyous consciousness He is and of what it might have been for Him to look at His creation and declare it very good. We pay a lot of money to get a tank with a few tropical fish in it and never tire of looking at their brilliant iridescence and marvelous forms and movements. But God has seas full of them which he constantly enjoys. We're enraptured by a well-done movie sequence or by a few bars from an opera or lines from a poem. We treasure our great experiences for a lifetime and may have very few of them, but God is simply one great, inexhaustible, eternal experience of all that is good and true and beautiful and right. Many, O oh Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. And so this is the God we come to. A God of matchless wonder beyond your imagination, creativity, limitless power, boundless love. David closes out Psalm 40 in verses 16 and 17 by writing, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. If only you and I could have David's perspective. Look at what it produced in his life. Instead of complaining about what he didn't have, David was grateful for what he had. Instead of choosing sin in the midst of his problems, throughout most of his life, David decided to trust and obey in the only one who really is God. Instead of being overwhelmed and hopeless in the midst of his struggles, David always held on to hope. 
And that makes all the difference, really, doesn't it? To live a life of hope because of who you know, because of whose you are. Let's pray. You know, I don't know that we understand how big our God is. <clears throat> there was a book written a number of years ago called Your God is Too Small. And that's really our problem. Not that our God is too small, but our perception of Him is so small. Even though all of creation heralds His majesty. If we knew who He was, if we knew how much He loves us, if we really knew that nothing is too hard for God, we would never worry. We would never worry. Because we would trust. We would trust in the only one who is God. And so ask God, to help you grow in your knowledge and love of Him. Because that's where trust is going to come from. You're not going to trust Him if you don't know Him and if you don't love Him. If you don't know who He is, how much He loves you, And I don't, know what, <clears throat> I don't know what it is that you may be facing in life right now. But I know that God's able to handle it. I know He's able to bring you through it. I don't know what the end result will be, but I know the end result will be for good. And so trust Him. Trust God in whatever you're doing. Don't take matters into your own hands. Don't turn aside to lies. Don't respond like the arrogant who think they know more than God. Trust Him. And while you're talking with God about these things, maybe you're with us today and you haven't yet come to a place of acknowledging Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the reason that both your mouth and your heart are mentioned there is because words aren't always an expression of our heart. But if they are an expression of our heart, if we understand our need of a Savior and the sufficiency of Jesus as that Savior, then our words are powerful enough to bring about salvation. And so if you're with me this morning, you're with us this morning, and you'd like to know this great God, there is only one way, and that's through His Son, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so if you want to know God, you've got to know Jesus. And you can know Him. You can find forgiveness. You can find a relationship with God. You can find salvation. If that's where you are this morning, if you would raise your hand, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. The words aren't magical, but if they are expressions of your heart, this will be the day of salvation. All you need to do is raise your hand. You're not sure where you stand with God, but you want the salvation that He freely offers.
Father God, many, O Lord, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare them and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. What an amazing truth, Lord. What an amazing truth this verse proclaims. And Father, I pray that it wouldn't just be a truth that the verse proclaims, but that it would be a truth we believe. A truth we believe in the very deep, deepest places of our heart so that we can trust you, Lord. So that we can know you are a good God. A God who does wonderful things. A God whose thoughts are always toward us. We praise you, O oh God. We acknowledge that there is none like you. Help us to worship you. Help us to worship you as we gather together with, with each other on Sundays. Help us to worship you, Lord, as we go throughout our day. Help us to remember that you are God. Help us to trust you. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You are listening to a sermon delivered to White Plains Baptist Church in Pomfret, Maryland. We hope that God speaks to you through this message. If you would like to know more about the church, you can find us on the web at wpbcmd.org and on Facebook at White Plains Baptist Church 1978.